name is Charles Moore, grew up in Long Beach, California. He attended UCSD and majored in chemistry and Spanish. He's such an accomplished person that really the only way to bullet point his successes is to pretty much start out every sentence with he is. So, he is an avid sailor, he is a published author, he is a woodworker, he actually ran a woodworking and finishing business for 25 years. He is an active environmentalist, he actually helped us kind of create our Blue Water Task Force for the Surfrider Foundation and the methods we use for testing water. He is a researcher. He founded the Alagita Marine uh, Research Foundation in 1994 to basically investigate what humans are doing to impact our oceans. Um, along the way, he has done and seen some remarkable things, which he's going to share with us tonight. Um, it's an absolute pleasure to have Captain Charles Moore here, so please help me welcome him. Surfrider is a great organization. I helped start the Long Beach chapter, it got me involved, made me realize we needed to look offshore beyond where our surfers could capture samples, and that's why I built the, the ship, the Algita, it means little pill plant in Spanish. I want to recognize uh, the, the, the group from Ensenada. You know, I tried to start a Surfrider uh, foundation in, in Ensenada at UABC in, in the not early 90s, and there was a surfer, a dentist, El Segurito, I don't know if you know him, but uh, you know, people didn't want to know how dirty the water was then. I brought him all the stuff, we were using an old-fashioned testing method, and he talked to his buddies and said, no, nah, I don't think we want to do this, you know, we just want to surf. And, and, you know, it's just, it's bad for tourism to know how dirty the water is. But uh, I'm happy to say that uh, I've just... Uh, gotten an order from IDEX, the new 18-hour Entera Alert and the Coley Alert test. 200 sets are going down that's not on my ship uh, this month. We're going to be testing along the border with uh, Raul Canino, uh, professor at UABC who has been doing uh, border and coastal water testing for a long time. And uh, it's great that you guys are active. Que bueno que ustedes están trabajando duro para nosotros, yeah. Excelente, porque es muy difícil. Ya, ya es la hora. Okay, so, uh, well, you know, um, I guess you could say it's a new world. Uh, uh, because, uh, you know, in, in just a few generations, we've totally changed uh, our lifestyles. And it's going to happen again. Uh, we had to conserve everything we had, you know. Uh, during World War II, we had to conserve all of our metals. This idea that the, the throwaway beer can, that in the late 40s, that would have been illegal. You'd have been busted. I mean, we had these victory posters during World War II. Look at the highlights, those three in the middle. Raise and share food. Walk and carry packages. Conserve everything you have. You know, that's a, a value system that doesn't exist today. Uh, it's coming back slowly, but it had to be abandoned. It was abandoned to, to keep up the productivity of the, the companies that built uh, these synthetic fibers in such great quantities to take the place of natural fibers during the war. Uh, so when we say shift happens, it's <laughs> going to happen. Shift is happening. Shift is happening. We shifted, and now we're shifting again. Uh, so what we, what we uh, this shift was symbolized by, in 1955, Life Magazine's article, uh, Throw Away Living. And the thesis was that mom could be liberated from the kitchen, you know, this is, this is mom being liberated. <laughs> but uh, these products are now mostly plastic, and the thing of it is, uh, it's very, difficult to recover and reuse. Uh, you can see that recycling is flat compared to use. Use goes up every year and recycling stays flat. So so why isn't plastic recycling simple? Why can't why isn't it like every other age in the history of mankind where it's Bronze Age, Iron Age, steel, Age of Steel, all these were never thought of as waste. That, there was a zero waste culture up until the 1950s. Uh, all the, the, the products that define the ages of humanity were reused. Uh, but plastic 
doesn't drive off the contaminants that absorb to it uh, in the remanufacturing process. It, it begins to melt at about the, the boiling point of water. And so uh, you, you've got a situation in which you, you've got a substance which has a very open molecular structure. It's, a, it's actually used to clean up oil spills. Those booms they put out around Exxon Valdez are made out of expanded polyethylene, expanded polypropylene. They're sponges for oily contaminants. So your milk bottle's never made into another milk bottle. It's illegal to take a milk bottle, melt it down, and put it in food back into that milk bottle. You'd have to put a virgin layer of plastic. Well, that doubles the cost. You've got your recycled plastic, which is expensive to do anyway, and then you've got to put a virgin layer of plastic on top of that before it can contact the milk again. So you can see why there's difficulties. So what we do is we downcycle it. We make plastic wood. Right now, this beach is being battered by 20 foot waves from Flossie, but uh, before that, just the sun on this track slumbered, you know, they didn't think that here's the government thinking, great, we're going to put plastic wood on the beach, we don't have to worry about moisture, but you don't realize this stuff has no structural integrity, it melts at such a low temperature that the rays of the sun warp it, and it doesn't, you know, it has to have a, it's not like wood that has internal Integrity, the picnic tables, the, the, the stuff breaks off. You have to support it from underneath. It's, even the downcycling, which means that there's no place for this wood to go except the landfill after it's done. It doesn't you know, get recycled in any closed loop sense. It's still a problem. So what happens? You've got a, a material that in order to drive the economy here, you've got a, a material that lasts virtually forever being used as a throwaway product. What's the consequence of that? Well, what it amounts to is that uh, it goes to the ocean. Uh, a lot of it's lightweight, but a lot of it goes into the sediments too. So we're just going to take a trip around the world and uh, look at uh, Biona Creek here that drains uh, downtown LA. Let's look at uh, Lagos, Nigeria. Somebody lucky enough to have a recreational vessel in Lagos, Nigeria. That's what they're uh, subjected to. You know, basically the same thing as next to the Queen Mary in downtown Long Beach. I mean. It, that's what it looks like after a rain. There's no difference. It's a very uh, democratic product in that sense. Uh, here is uh, the Greenpeace crew on the Esperanza. I don't know if you remember when she docked here uh, last uh, November uh, here in San Diego, the, the Esperanza, but they were on a voyage to the uh, trash vortex, uh, which I led for them. And uh, before we embarked on that voyage, we went to uh, Kahuku Beach, which is right by a public golf course on the island of Oahu, and collected uh, trash. And I, I took my snorkel and fins, because uh, I got to get wet, and uh, I went out there just about where that first wave's breaking, and got 410 golf balls, just from one little strip, which totally eroded all the coral, of course, and uh, blew me away. I took them up to the pro shop, and I said, look, put these in a box and tell the golfers to quit hitting the balls out there stupid. <laughs> so this beach now is being battered by 20-foot waves. This is the south end of the Big Island. This is Camilla Beach. If any of you, did any of you see the Animal Planet show, uh, Natural World Hawaii Message in the Waves? Nobody saw that. Okay, well that was pretty cool. That had me on Camilla Beach talking about the issue there of uh, the dirtiest beach in the world. But you know, uh, it could be uh, uh, a situation in which we're drowning in our own trash. This is, these are some incipient recyclers trying to deal with the situation by reusing some of this crap. But you know, here's an artist in Australia took a trip up to Brisbane and decided to uh, make surfboards out of the crap he found up there. Uh, so these are uh, done by Blackwell, an artist in Australia. Here's a little close-up. There's 500 pieces of trash in each one of these boards. But you know, as surfers, uh, we don't get off scot-free. That's uh, stuff he found that's old surfboards that he made an artwork out of too. So, you know, our stuff pollutes too. I've got a piece of foam up here. You can see how it just shreds into these tiny fragments. So it's all over the world. It's a plastic planet. It's everywhere. The fastest growing is actually Antarctica, the highest rate of change, the pristine uh, uh, habitat of Antarctica is being turned into a plastic wasteland faster than any other place on Earth, with exotic species riding in and taking over on the plastic. So, 
this is the shift that we need to, to think about. You know, in, a, in an economy that's growing and new, you don't worry about what your product's going to do. You just want to get it out there on the market. It's like these drugs, you know, they, they put them out there and then a little while later they find out, you know, I mean, they tell you it gives you bloody stools, but they don't tell you, you know, it, gives, it kills you. you know? but, uh, <laughs> then, the, they, you know, we try to control it, and then we spend all this money. That super fund, remember the idea of Love Canal, the super fund? We're spending all the money, we want to spend all the money, we're rich, right? We made all this money by ignoring prevention, getting all our products out to market, becoming the world's economic power. We didn't control, we didn't clean up. The shift now is we're going to have to spend a lot of time thinking about what the stuff's going to do before we put it out there. So how much total plastic really comes down these rivers? How much are we really seeing out there? This is what we try to find out. This is what our research is about. And we looked at uh, the two main rivers, the LA and the San Diego River going into San Pedro Bay. There are some factories. We looked at plastic factories. We sampled using different types of nets. That one in the middle is a stream bed sampler, then we had a uh, hand net on the side to catch the stuff. Because plastic is hydrophobic, water fearing. It, it runs away from water. So you actually find more plastic trying to get out of the river. It's up on the sides. That's why we have to sample all the different substrates. And then we used our manitrol oil like we use out at sea to do the surface. And uh, we w worked in heavy rain conditions. Uh, and we also worked in dry conditions. We had, so in three days, two wet and one dry, this is the, uh, the difficult thing to believe, uh, two billion pieces of plastic, less than 4.75 millimeters, but greater than one millimeter, were going down these rivers. Uh, the larger pieces, 287 million, that's your bottles and stuff like that, and the total 2.3 billion in just three days of sampling. And yet, you'll hear figures like uh, 8 million pieces of trash enter the world's oceans every day. You know, it's because people are ignoring the small stuff. We sweat the small stuff. Uh, and we're going to talk more about why. Uh, we, the Nerdal Art, this is done by Chuck Stone, an artist in uh, Seal Beach. He, uh, this is the Nerdal King. It's, uh, these are the pellets. Every plastic object starts its life as one of these pellets, pre-production plastic pellets. We make 100 billion pounds of them in the United States every year. Every man, woman, and child in America weighs 50 billion pounds. So we make two pounds for every pound of body weight of every man, woman, and child in America in those pellets. And we lose them. To, we lose 236 million of them to the ocean every three days out of LA, two wet and one dry day. This is the head of the uh, South Bay chapter, uh, uh, Alan Walty, uh, picking up polyvinyl chloride pellets during our research uh, at uh, a rail car. But what happens is these pipes here, these are vacuum tubes. They go into a valve that's right here at the bottom of the car, suck it out. When they undo the valve, the guys don't shut it off, and the stuff falls out. And this happens so often that 10% of the particles you find on beaches worldwide are these little pellets. Now, Dr. Takato at the University of Tokyo School of Agriculture uh, found that he could assess the, the pollutants in seawater by looking at them in the pellets. And he found that they are sponges, as we talked about, for these oily pollutants. And they concentrate them up to a million times their level in the seawater. So, here we've got a, a, a material whose span uh, of life and the environment is unknown, and that it breaks down by UV rays from the sun, but it, final biodegradation is indeterminate. So you get the situation, here's a fifth, you'd think after 15 years, this thing would have, you know, cracked or something and busted off. But they put these UV stabilizers in them. That's these additives that are getting into the media now that are causing the hormone disruption and cancers and asthma and diabetes, and uh, Dr. Von Saul thinks the current epidemic of obesity is related to um, the uh, bisphenol A in canned food liners, the, the epoxy that lines the cans of every kind of canned food, including organic carrots from wild oats. That can of organic carrots has got bisphenol A lining it, 
And that causes obesity, that, that changes your insulin metabolism. So the situation is that uh, you've got a material that's very long lasting in the environment and it's not just in a single aberration. I mean, it's not just that one turtle, it's here's a turtle in a six pack ring that's got the same situation going on. Uh, now, how fast is this changing? When I say shift happens, this shift has happened really fast. Dr. Ogie found that in the night, you know, it was going up about the same level as plastic production for up until the 1990s. But then with globalization and no recycling infrastructure, no end game, no take back for plastics, no way to deal with after you're through with it. You get this exponential increase and went up by a factor of 10 every two to three years off Japan, sampling, pulling these nets, looking at these particles going up by a factor of 10 every two to three years in the 90s. We found uh, three times more plastic than Dr. Day found in the 80s. We found in our 1999 study out in the middle of the Pacific. This is a, a jar of one mile trawl of our sample. I'll, I'll pass it around. That's what it looks like. That's what our ocean's turning into. This is how we sample it, pull that manitrol. That's the sample I'm passing around the room right now. That's what, if you, this is as far from land as you can get anywhere on Earth. This is not near an urban center. This is as far from land as you can get anywhere on Earth. That's what the situation is in the ocean. Uh, our published study found that a, a ratio of six times as much plastic as zooplankton by weight. Uh, it's being ingested. This is salps. Uh, chordate jellies distantly related to human. These things feed by just vacuuming. Just, that's just a vacuum tube. That's what that thing is. Anything that'll fit in the end gets stuck in there. This is fishing line inside a cell. See it being taken out there. This is one that we fed. We collected plastic out in the ocean, then collected some salps, put them in a fish tank, and watched the salps eat them. This is one that ate it. They eat it really fast because they. They, they process half the water column they inhabit every day. Uh, we think this means that the stuff's being eaten also because in our 27,000 pieces of plastic, you know, we found about 10,000 at the one millimeter class level. You'd think those one millimeter pieces would break into a lot of half millimeter pieces, but it crashes. If you look down here at a third of a millimeter, there's only a third as many as at one millimeter. That doesn't make sense. You break up a cookie, you get a lot of cookie crumbs. Well, what's happening is these salps and all these filter feeders are programmed to eat these small things. They have no genetic you know, ability to change. It's, this is a feeding strategy developed over eons of time. So that's the way the bulk of the feeding takes place in the ocean. It's through just bumping into stuff and sticking to it. And, and that's the base of the marine food web, and that's what's being invaded by plastic. So here's some evidence that we developed using Lorena Rios, un estudiante en la Universidad Autónoma, ya está doctora in Stockton, and she's doing our analysis using her advanced uh, uh, mass spectroscopy uh, to find out how much pollutants are on these plastics out in the gyre. And these are levels that she found of PCBs, levels of pesticides, out in the middle of the ocean, out in the middle of nowhere, higher <coughs> levels right there in this gyre, and PAHs. So what's wrong with that? What's the problem? Uh, why do we care that there's a bunch of plastic floating around with pollutants on it? Uh, well, this is a question we're seeking to answer. When we first discovered that nurdles were coming down the rivers, that was a, uh, a student younger than Veronica that did a science project at the mouth of the Santa Ana River. Every month her dad would take her down there and she would uh, do the same square meter of beach. And she found out that after a rain she had like 250 nurdles in one square meter. And this was a consistent result. Every time it would rain she would find more nurdles. So, uh, uh, that led us to the conclusion that they were coming from land. A lot of people thought they were from ships, that the, the ships were dumping the nurdles or they were falling out of containers. And that was a theory for a long time. But a student doing a science project went to national. I want to emphasize the importance of having uh, students involved in the effort. And, and Surf Riders really great bringing in youth, getting them involved. So these are all the stations we've, we've, we've sampled in our work uh, offshore on board or Vialguita. Uh, 
Uh, and we found this concentration there, you can see, just out of the middle of nowhere, uh, where it's greater than six to one ratio of plastic to plankton, in the middle of nowhere, and where, and where it's, the contaminants are higher as well. So this is the vessel I was on. This is the Esperanza. This is the Greenpeace's flagship. This is their 2,000 ton Russian firefighting vessel that had a special room where you could be decontaminated from radiation if there was another Chernobyl, which Greenpeace, of course, turned into a sauna bath. <laughs> and, uh, we went out there. They, they trawl the big yellow thing. They don't use a manitrawl. They, they had this built by some engineer that really over-engineered it, but made a, a huge uh, a device for sampling plastic, which I was gratified that we developed this uh, into a, an issue such that Greenpeace embraced it as one of their worldwide campaigns. And the problem happened was that this trip, we couldn't go to the gyre. We couldn't, remember that circle, that oval? We couldn't go there, there was a storm there. So we had to stay down close by a way and kind of below where the supposed garbage patch was. And that was the mind blower. This stuff has gone up so fast now we're finding toolboxes out there. Their campaign every night they're sending. This is the you know Greenpeace has got to make bucks out of it. every little thing they do because they got to spend money on a 2,000 ton vessel on another Rainbow Warrior. They got shipped. Man, that their holes in the ocean. You throw money in. That's what a boat is. So you know, boat stands for bring on another thousand. That's what it's. Like. So uh, of course. They had a German uh, head of the science team, so we had to do it everything bilingual. <laughs> and this goes out every night on their big satellite transmitter. There's a huge dome as big as that white light up there on the ceiling that sends out all this stuff, video, every night. So they, they do mount a very powerful worldwide campaign. But this is what blew my mind. I took the same route in my ship in uh, the year 2000, and we didn't find this type of contamination in that area. We found very few pieces of plastic. So in six years, that area had degenerated to the state of the garbage patch itself. This is the shocker. This is the speed at which the environment is deteriorating. It's a tremendous, tremendous problem. I mean, uh, this is the environment for those fish. This is what they're surrounded by. This is the plastic where that Xanthina snail, the beautiful purple snails of the open ocean. And the only insect in the ocean, the Halibates, these water striders, the only insect that live in the ocean, these are being displaced by plastic. Uh, and it's being eaten. I mean, look, tell me that that's not predation. Tell me that Ziploc hasn't been eaten. He uh, said so that's some natural, I mean, that's some, you know, chemical, no, uh, that's being bit. Something's eating that stuff. And it's transporting stuff around the world. You know, we hear a lot about bilge water, about exotics coming in on ships, bottoms. But really, if you think about it, the most effective way to transport an organism throughout the ocean is to put it on a slow boat. And pieces of plastic move very slow. It takes six years to go around the North Pacific Ocean on a piece of plastic. You can take an oyster from Japan and put it over in an oyster bed in British Columbia, and that trip could take five, six years. That oyster has time then to acclimate to the new surroundings. Uh, that's what's happening in Antarctica. We're taking organisms that have, and with global warming makes it even easier, have you know, only existed in a latitude far above the polar latitudes now are acclimating in polar latitudes. This causes what's known as biotic mixing. Uh, it's like all the weeds in San Diego and the vacant lots aren't from California, they're from England. Well, that's what's happening in the ocean with the plastic. It's being transported. So, estimates have been done, on, you know, and plastic's really good about occupying all the niches. It's so varied. It has so many forms. It can occupy all these different niches in the ocean environment. If you get total biotic mixing, such that everything gets mixed up with everything else, you lose over half of the species. They are outcompeted, just like you've lost over half of the weeds in your vacant lots. So anyway, uh, I'm going to rush through this, but we not only looked at uh, how much plastic came down, we looked at the phthalates, these endocrine disruptors, these 
things that change the sexual expression in baby boys, uh, undescended testicles, uh, and found high levels in, in everything uh, uh, that we picked up, the, the phthalates. We also looked at the PAHs, the things that are carcinogenic, that are part of our modern lifestyle, that are part of the soot that, that is generated by combustion, and found them all over the place. So uh, we found the phthalates and even the virgin pellets. We didn't find the PAHs in the virgin because they come from the environment. They're picked up by the plastic out of the environment. They pick it up and transport it and make it easy to eat. So uh, how much plastic is out there? You know, I was asked to provide a figure, so I pulled a number out of the hat for the World Federation of Scientists meeting in Ariche, Sicily last year where we were first recognized as a new planetary emergency. Pollution of water by plastic is now one of 17 planetary emergencies listed by the World Federation of Scientists. And what I said was, you know, it's, I've, I've done a lot of thinking about this, studied a lot of figures on recycling and recovery and waste stream in the United States, and I, I think it's very conservative to say that 2.5% of world production since the 1950s has made it into the ocean, what would be 100 million tons. That is a conservative figure in my opinion. So we've got these hormone disruptors, the, the flame retard, you know, we have a situation in which we're so bad at prevention that we find a problem and replace it with a worse one as a solution. We replaced PCBs with polybrominated diphenyl ethers, PBDEs, Many of them are worse than the PCBs were. Flame retardant. You know, be very careful when people tell you they've got a solution for a particular type of pollutant and give you another chemical. The, the studies, it's, it's like, you know, you're chasing your tail, like one drug's supposed to fix the problem from the other drug. It just goes on and on and on. So, you haven't heard much about it? Why haven't you heard much about it? What's the deal? Well, we have what we call manufactured uncertainty. There was an article in the 2006 Scientific America called Doubt is Their Product. There are companies that tell these big producers, what conclusion do you want? We'll design an experiment to give you that conclusion. So all of the chemical corporations who looked at harm from this phenol A, 12 found no harm, 100% found no harm. Just even the government studies 138, 93% found harm. So if you've got it, or you can, it's like you can buy an election, uh, you can buy a scientific result. This is the situation we find ourselves in today. So we're being very timid about dealing with the situation. Surfriders taking up the challenge. I really love that concept, rising above plastic. That's really original, really cool. Surfriders always on the vanguard. So uh, we really do have to shift our emphasis. We really do have to shift our emphasis. Shift happens. Shift is happening now. You don't think, you think that the United States is always going to be the number one country in the world? You think that's going to be the, the case? Anyway, uh, these are two dedicated biologists. When you see photographs of uh, albatross with bottle caps coming out from inside of them, like this, like this, this here. This is Cynthia Vanderlip. She's wearing a hagfish trap. This is the jawless fish that, you know, when a whale dies and falls to the bottom of the ocean, it's got all those hagfish limes uh, eating it up. Well, those are traps. They, they're a delicacy in the Orient and, and also used for leather. And they make these little traps, these cylinders, and they put those cones at the end they can't get out. Well, they're littering all over the beaches of the South and North Pacific. That's her and her daughter. They pick up tons and tons of these nests from the remotest island of uh, the Hawaiian chain, Kiri Atoll. And, you know, it's as far as you can get from civilization, but you can still watch TV. I mean, that's 3,500 miles from Los Angeles, 1,500 miles from Alaska, and 2,000 miles from Japan. Now, that's watching ATV. It's not really watching TV, but the point is, our civilization is invading. There is no such thing as remoteness. There is no such thing as pristine anymore, and that's because of plastic. So 
we don't want that to be our legacy. And there's our recyclers in Manila Bay making the best of a bad situation. So thank you very much.